I, so my name is Sean. Uh, I've come from Front Porch, as Michael has said. I wanted to say thank you to Michael. I've been aware of SLIF for a pretty long time. It's kind of a famous get together that I was never able to attend until now, finally. And then to have an opportunity to actually be before you and talk a little bit about stuff I'm doing and some of the things that, that I and we think that I know are in common with some of the things that you are doing and thinking as well is a real honor. Um, a few things occur to me. Number, let me just take a heat check. There's a lot going on in this world, I'm, I'm sure. I just want to, just a, a little sober moment, as amazing as last night was and as I think engaging as these discussions will continue to be. The world that we live in demands that we hear one another with big ears so that we might discover the things that we actually have in common versus the things that we want to fight about and try to be right about all the time. So I'm a little overwhelmed, so bear with me by some of the things that are happening across the oceans. And uh, I'm sure you all are too, I just want to acknowledge that. Uh, so on to the business of the business. I, I want to thank Carlos from last night. He reminded me, and I think the rest of us, that there is at least one truism in this world, and that is that the clock doesn't tick backwards. He mentioned that he was 27 and starting to feel his age moving into his middle 30s, middle and late 30s, kind of 10 years prior. I also want to thank Roy, truly. One of the things that he offered was, was the, the loss of the ability to connect or the intention to connect with the other. And he talked about self-checkout and doing somebody else's job and all that other jazz, which I totally abide by. One of the great gifts from COVID that I'd happily return uh, in order not to have gone through that for any of us was the revitalization of the importance of that connection. So some of the things that we'll talk about perhaps over these next 15, 20 minutes, and also maybe later on, and a lot of the things that I know you guys are driving is, how do we create connection while not necessarily being physically present? We have more ways to do that and value it more now than we ever have, and I'm super, super grateful, grateful for that. I'm glad for Roy to have pointed it out. So as Michael said, I've been at Front Porch for six months. I've been in the space for just a little over 25 years. I came to the space working on the finance and development side, creating communities, physical communities, often just right out of the ground, often on behalf of or with not-for-profits, sometimes others around the country. Uh, I came to the work, like so many people in this space, accidentally. You hear a couple things, I came to it accidentally. I'm in this field not on purpose. It wasn't my original plan. Well, for me, that was true. The other thing that you hear is I came to this work because I had people in my life that were older that I loved, that I had a devotion to, that I learned from, that I aspired to be near and be with and be like. And I had that too, and in this case, I'll be super quick. My brother Peter and I essentially grew up with our grandparents. Our parents were divorced when we were early adolescents. We spent about 10 years of our lives essentially living in our grandparents' house. That house was a very, very unique place. My grandmother, small town, New Jersey, just outside of Philadelphia, she was quite the socialite in this tiny little town, so much so that every Tuesday, while my brother Peter and I were living in this house, she would have friends and family come over to get their hair done. That is a major anchoring event in life for people in the middle, of the middle to late 70s. And we'd have anywhere between eight and 10 women in the kitchen at my grandparents and me and my brother. And these women, if you weren't under the hair dryer, the spaceship hair dryer, we had, she had one of those in the, in the uh, laundry room that got rolled out. If you weren't under the hair dryer, you, either, you were talking about the person that was under the hair dryer. And secondly, uh, you were drinking and you were, my, you were probably smoking. Not my brother and I, but that was the way of the world back then. And we were a part of that group. We were engaged in the same conversations about what was going on down the street, who was interested in whom and why and so forth for the formative years of our lives. So much so that my grandmother always, I had my own booze, I had a drink in the same highball glass as everybody else, but it was made out of Coke and orange juice. But that was their way of making me feel a part of their zone. And that was a big deal to me looking back. The other thing that happened in that house, the other thing that happened in that house, it was also my grandfather's house. He wasn't quite as social, but he was the town doctor. So my grandfather, being the town doctor back in the days where you carried a bag and wore a trench coat and wore a hat, you know, true Moonlight Graham style, he cared for people in that town and they knew who they were at a deep, deep level. So much so that the people in this same town, if you got stuck, if he saw that you were stuck and didn't have anyone and didn't have anything and didn't have a way forward after your procedure or after something happened that was terrible, you would live in that house too. So in this life, growing up through my adolescent period, I had these Tuesday night gigs 
increasingly friends in and out, but I also got to live with people that were in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. A man named Dan Rodman, who was at the Battle of the Bulge, would indulge me constantly over coffee. I had coffee at a very, at a very young age, unfortunately, uh, unlike Dwayne. Um, Bess Hassenfort, her family owned a safe company. I learned about you know, what it meant to listen for the tumblers and how effective that could or couldn't be. Sarah Starr was a budding actress, never really made it, but her car was my first car. Ann Maloney spent every Thanksgiving that I can remember at our, as a kid at the head of our table. They were beautiful times, and then when I was exposed to what senior living might be, I had all of these people and all those experiences in mind. Truly, the social piece, the caregiving piece, the connection piece. The first time I worked, walked into a continuing care retirement community not knowing what it was and expecting to find nothing but the doldrums and sadness and loss and awfulness, the, the, all of those things that the world tells you that aging is only about, I saw this. I saw people coming together joyfully, doing things together, expressing their opinions, living their lives, moving on. Different than what the world expected, and this was 25 years ago, and it's still too damn different if you ask me. Anyway, I come to Front Porch. I spent some time at Kendall, the Kendall Corporation. I'm proud of the work that was done there and that I got to be a part of. That's a national-based company, mostly uh, independent living and continuing care retirement communities for context. I chose to come to Front Porch about a year and change ago, and I started six months ago, and that's a whole other story. Um, I am currently bi-coastal. I live in just outside of Philadelphia, and I live in Pasadena. And I came to Front Porch because there was the possibility that these two, there were two companies that make, what, what make up what Front Porch now is. One was called Front Porch, one was called Covia. And if you imagine that there was an acquisition that occurred where Front Porch bought, uh, bought Covia, two relatively large not-for-profit providers all over the state of California with a diverse array of products, continuing care, nursing, assisted, memory care, affordable housing, middle market housing, uh, community service programs, technology platforms, et cetera. The problem was you had these two organizations put together and one was like IBM and the other one was like Ben and Jerry's, literally. So the, culture, the cultures of the two were so far apart that it actually creates an incredible opportunity to build something brand new altogether. So that's what we're doing. So what I've been doing for the last six months or so is number one, try to understand what, what, what does everyone else make of all of this? I could see it from all the way across the country that you had these two organizations that needed to build on a great legacy, but also be okay to move away from it. In order to figure out how to do that, we need to meet each other. We need to spend time knowing who each person within the organization was, thousands and thousands of people at a time. I'm grateful that in this day and age, you can do a lot of those meetings from long, long distances, but I was just talking to a man I met last night named Tom, Tom I think. Those first meetings, man, if they're not in person, you're losing something. So what we've been doing for the last six months is truly being present with the folks that work with us, the folks that work with the people that we care for, the folks that, the folks that are our customers, our potential customers, our partners, our vendors, our professionals, et cetera, trying to understand what matters to them. Where do they see themselves in the future as professionals and as people that are living their lives as they get older in a place that they choose, in community? And the funny thing about where people see themselves goes back a little bit to some, a lot of the research that's been done, so much of which was done before COVID, and I think the evidence is even, more e is even easier to see today. Back in 2018 and 2019, there were so many studies going on, warning of the baby boomers, right? It's coming down the pike, it's coming down the, down the pike. I heard about this when I first came to this field in the 90s. Well, it's here, and it's been here, and we, we'd better get ready if we're not. Interestingly, what, what is said based on the research about the baby boomers, those folks that we are continuing to, continuing to serve more and more and more as the generations are shifting, is that they're gonna be really demanding. These baby boomers expect to be seen and heard, and their families expect to be seen and heard. They expect to have agency. They expect to be able to find purpose. They expect to, they expect to if they're gonna join in for something for five, 10, 15, even 20 years, they expect to know that they are coming into an organization that has a point of view. They expect to feel a sense of belonging within a community of people that are real, authentic, to use Dwayne's comment, and I agree. Funny thing about all that is, it's really, really hard to serve a consumer population that has these high expectations unless, unless 
You can commit to being real, to being vulnerable, to being transparent, and to being engaged. Crazy thing, it's awfully, awfully hard to find great good people too. It's awfully hard to find great good people too. But guess what they want? The studies here to four on millennials and Gen Zers, they want almost the same thing. They want to be engaged. They expect to be respected. They expect to be heard. They expect to have a voice. They expect to be able to have impact beyond just their job, but on the company. So in so many ways right now, we're driving toward trying to accommodate the same sorts of sensibilities. And of course, in this day and age, I went on to chat G GPT, having, having access to that new application, looking for similarities across those generations. And they are clear as day. Age is completely different. But the manifestation of the sensibilities of the generations that we are working with, hoping to work with, serving and hoping to serve, are very, very much in common. And they are demanding our humanity and our connection. They are demanding that we can demonstrate a community to them that they want to be a part of, but also feel that they can contribute to. And I do recognize I'm talking an awful lot about CCRCs and independent living, and that is true. I would submit that there are other ways in which other elements of the continuum also find incredible appeal in finding ways to be a part of this larger thing, ways that, where they can discover and act on purpose that we don't think and, or offer enough. So all that's interesting to know. And as I mentioned, we've got this company that's come together to becoming one, and the one thing we've not yet created. I've spent a fair bit of time trying to understand, now that we've met each other for the last six months, what are we going to do next? How do we bring this stuff to life? Because the words are cool. We can read Peter Drucker's book and it says, you know, culture eats strategy and all that other jazz. My board wants to know what the strategy is, what's the plan. And I'm not just going to tell them that culture will eat that plan because they're both important, wildly important. But what we can do is decide to pay attention to the things that matter most and then to begin to understand how those things that matter most strategically connect to one another. So as a larger organization right now, what we're doing is we're undertaking an initiative to focus on four critical areas and the first one starts with culture. We start with culture and we are defining it as demonstrating the ability to, to drive a place that, is, that, that, that everyone will walk into and feel welcome. Everyone can feel part of. Everyone gives to and gets from. And that demands a whole bunch of other behaviors that we'll talk more about later. Not later today, but later in our process. But define the culture that we aspire to that meets those needs of the world that we live in so that we can be successful in demonstrating that we have a care about stuff, that we have a point of view, and that we can, yes, be committed to delivering services and programs, not just in accordance with what we think is right, but in accordance with what the marketplace thinks is right, what it needs, what it thrives on. The second thing that we're focusing on is leadership. So this new organization, Two Becoming One, is starved for centralized leadership. The corporate structure is perfect. It can be driven as a top-down enterprise all day long. We don't have to herd the cats, but the behavior has to change. We have to commit, I was so enamored with some of the things that Duane was saying, we have to commit with a common understanding of a culture of excellence so that we can drive toward that excellence and we have to be okay at the leadership level driving toward that kind of performance, driving toward quality, driving toward a culture. Celebrating those things that happen inside a culture, those behaviors that occur, and knowing what to do when those things don't occur. And recognizing that no culture, no place is gonna be perfect all the time. Recognizing that it's our duty to try to create as many of those great moments as we can. On our best days, what do we look like? And how do we have more and more best days? Leadership. The other part of leadership, if we're going to drive from the center, we also have to be able to drive from the ground up, too. It's a balance. So if we're going to lead in a culture that says everybody matters, we've got to make sure that everybody is contributing to the decisions that are being driven from that center point. And we've got to be able to demonstrate that. We have to prove it. We can't just ask the questions, what do you think? We have to be able to show that what we are learning is contributing to the movement that we are making, leadership. The third area is performance. You know, survive to 2025 is an interesting comment that, I, that, that resonates with me to an extent. Um, it is not an opportunity to be able to be maximally efficient and effective in everything that we do. It is not merely an opportunity to be able to leverage scale whether it's scale of financial scale, or operational scale, or reputational scale. It is not an opportunity to be true to what it is that you say, what you represent in the marketplace. These are half two things in this dynamic world. It's more competitive, it's more expensive, it's more sophisticated. This work is more meaningful and more in demand 
in the ways that the market wants it than it ever will be. We don't have a choice but to know how to do the best work as often as we can. Driving performance. And then there's growth. Growth in the sense that first, we gotta make sure that the foundation is strong. So in our case, we have to grow up, literally. We have to mature as an organization. We have to define and adopt and then activate the systems that bring us together that, so that we can operate maximally and efficiently. We also have to recognize that we have lots of different programs that are demanding to grow. Can't grow them all. They're not all worthy of growing, but they're all worthy of understanding which ones are we gonna let go and which ones we're gonna take hold of. Connection and community and technology platforms that can enhance our real estate is an incredible area of opportunity for us. Moving into the marketplace where there's more and more understanding for the value and the social determinants of health that we've always provided so beautifully for is an area of opportunity for us. At the same way, we have to get our act together and know every one of our 20 some odd market rate physical assets, where are they, where do they need to go in order to meet the needs of the future market, and if they can't get there, they gotta become something else, whether under somebody else's watch or ours. So planning for growth, not just responding to what's happening in the world, is a new movement that we need to make. Planning for that growth. And yes, there are gonna be more and more opportunities, not just to get bigger for the sake of getting bigger. Not at all. But I do believe if we can pull this together, if we can stand for something, if we can have a culture that is authentic, if we can have leadership that is consistently driving to that culture in ways that are conspicuous in the world, if we can perform at scale, and deliver quality, to deliver the promise, deliver on the promises that we make, the world will be our oyster, and that may be a have to too. Because I don't think standing still right now is gonna get anybody anywhere. So, super quick story for me, trying, as a person trying to wrap all this stuff together in a way that people might not expect. Culture, leadership, performance, and growth. I saw in the New York Times a few months ago, there was a story on a women's basketball team. Average age was about 85 years old. Senior Women's Basketball Association. Happens that they're based in San Diego. I was in the neighborhood, so I stopped by and met with this woman named Karen Blair. She's the director there. She's been at it a long time. They also happen to be on TV on ESPN in a pretty big way. And I said, Karen, you have to know I'm new here. I love basketball, I love women's basketball in particular, I've got three daughters, I've been coaching most of my adult life, it's a thing for me, and I, I work for a senior living company. First thing she did was assume that I wanted to poach her mailing list, which was interesting, and she told me, thank God. But over coffee, we got past it, and the short story is, we have the, the first of many to come senior women's basketball league franchises in Carlsbad associated with one of our communities down that way in Southern California. Couple things, and what is that? Last week we had, they're gonna be doing a 15 minute, I think it airs tomorrow on Wednesday, uh, they're gonna be doing a 15 minute expose on all this, how this has happened and what's going on. We've got people from the greater community that are a part of this program. We have 80 plus year old residents, they're playing basketball, playing in games, working out, coming together in community. We're getting publicity all over the map. We're, he, we're having people come to us and say, oh my God, I didn't know these were the things that were happening inside of retirement communities. It's amazing. I didn't even know this was possible. I get to still play basketball. I grew up playing basketball. I always watch my kids play basketball, et cetera. It's happening. So what is that? Well, to me, it's a culture, number one, where you're curious enough, where you're paying enough attention and you're curi curious enough to notice that there might be something in there that could be cool that doesn't yet exist. It's a culture that doesn't presume that it, because it's outside the boundaries of the normal working day that it might not be useful, interesting, impactful. It takes a little bit of leadership, not from me. I just notice and pass it on. Guess what? We have a woman who is working as the activities director and then some at this place at Carlsbad who picked up on this notion and ran with it and then shared it across the entire organization to the point now we're growing other potential franchises across Front Porch, and I would submit that it's probably pretty cool, maybe cool enough, to grow more and more. Leadership and growth, performance. This one little instance, this one little instance has already generated more leads, we've gotten more free press, we've got ad revenue coming out, you know, coming at us, excuse me, we have, we have advertising, if you will, that we are not paying for that is having more impact both in social media and in newspapers and on television. We couldn't afford it. And the impact is better because it's real. 
because it's real and it's born from who we are, what we say we are, and how we're behaving. So we've got a long way to go. I don't come here as any guru about anything, but that's my story and I'm sticking to it and I'm super grateful for your time and attention and hope to see you all later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean.